I would want parents to understand something that the vast majority of the lay population does not understand. Self-control is not learned. It is not the result of your upbringing and how good your parents were. This is one of the most profound insights from our research on ADHD. ADHD, as we will see, is largely a neurogenetic disorder. But then let's pursue the implication. If that is true and ADHD is a self-regulation disorder, then self-control is largely neurogenetic in origin. That has a philosophically profound conclusion. The vast majority of variation in the people sitting in this room and their ability to manage their behavior is not from how they were raised. It is a part of who they are. It is a part of their neurogenetic gifts. And that is very stunning indeed, that our capacity for regulating ourselves is a neurobiological trait, not some socially learned phenomena that you just happen to pick up from your parents. So I would want them to know that ADHD, being a self-regulation disorder, is arising out of neurogenetic causes, and that this inability to direct behavior toward yourself comes from impairments in the following five executive abilities. And these have to do with brain development, not with training. It does not mean that training cannot enhance them. It means that they don't originate at the beginning in training, in the social environment. The social environment requires that they be there already, and then it will help to shape them to become more proficient. Think of your language ability. You didn't learn language, but it doesn't mean that you can't become more proficient in how you speak and how you write. But speaking and writing are not accounted for on the basis merely of training by your parents. You're going to develop a language no matter where you grow up. That is a neurobiological trait, and it unfolds as the brain unfolds. It is an instinct, and so is self-control. But self-control can be reduced to these five things. What are the five things you do to yourself? These are the things your child struggles to do. Number one, can you stop? Can you wait? Because as Rabelais said in the novel Gargantua, which most of you have never read, I'm sure, but it is where this phrase comes from. Everything comes to those who can wait. The waiting is the tough part. You must build in a pause between the event and what you plan to do about it. And in ADHD, there is no pause. The event happens, and your response is up, out, done. It is as if there was no front part to the brain. It is as if you were like any other species with a spinal cord. Event, response, event, response. Or as in a Gary Larson cartoon, remember the far side? Two amoebas, a husband and wife, talking to each other. One amoeba, the wife, of course, says to her husband, stimulus response, stimulus response. Don't you ever think? (laughs) Characterizes ADHD right there. Don't you ever think? Once you stop, you will engage in four subsequent actions. The first is mental imagery. You will recall the past, and you will play a DVD of it in your head. You have a theater in your mind. It is your visual imagery system, the mind's eye. So your child not only cannot stop, they cannot visualize as well as other children. And what they do not visualize before they act is the past, the relevant past. Do you have experiences in this situation previously? If so, what would they have told you to do? Lay people call this hindsight, and the word sight is no coincidence. You are visually imagining your history. What does it have to say? And you lack hindsight. Now this will lead to foresight. You look back to anticipate. What does ADHD lead to? No foresight. You are not thinking ahead because you weren't looking back either. Hindsight and foresight are the opposite sides of the same coin. Visual imagery. So you will not use your images of your past to tell you what to do. You will just do. And then by five years of age, you will get the third executive deficit. You can't talk to yourself. 
Young children by five years of age are beginning to internalize their speech and use it on themselves. Just watch any first and second grade classroom and you will see this. If you have a three to five year old, you'll hear it. They're talking to themselves out loud most of the day, whether anyone is in the room or not. Listen to bedtime and you will hear what I mean. But over the next 10 years, this external voice gets directed to themselves and slowly made private and mental in its form. And so originates the voice in your head. And that voice in your head is there for one very important reason. It's to help control yourself. You start telling yourself what to do and it starts to work. And now any family I would explain this to would understand that not only can your child not stop, not only do they not have the mind's eye, they don't have the mind's voice. And what is there is very weak. It's not controlling them. So now you know why they can't do what you tell them to do. They can't follow instructions, they can't follow rules, they can't internalize the rules of the situation, because everything I have just said requires a voice in your head, and they don't have that. The next comes from the first three, and that is the mind's heart, the ability to manage your emotions so that they are more socially acceptable, so that they are consistent with your goals, not conflicting with your welfare. And so we will see the ADHD child, as we've already described them, easily frustrated, quick to anger, impatient, and just overall more excitable and more emotional than others. But what gets lost in this explanation is something more fundamental. Our emotions are our motivations. If you cannot manage your emotions, you cannot manage your motivation either. Because the fourth executive ability is the source of self-motivation. Self-motivation is the fuel tank for all future directed behavior. There is no getting ready for tomorrow if there is no self-motivation. So what has the ADHD child lost here? They cannot motivate themselves. What does that mean? It means that you will always be dependent on the environment around you and its immediate consequences for how hard and how long you can work. And if there are no consequences in that context, you cannot work. You cannot persist you will not get it done. The fourth executive ability now explains to these parents why this child can play video games for hours and cannot do homework for more than a few minutes. Because the video game provides external, continuous, 100% consequences for interacting with it, and the homework does nothing. When a problem is solved on a sheet of paper, nothing happens. The consequences are delayed, and therein lies the trouble. So the corollary of this is if you want to see an ADHD person fail, you put them in any environment where there are no consequences, and I guarantee you failure. The work will not get done because the person cannot self-motivate. And this is not a choice, and this is not willful, and this is not a child who just could, if they wished, wake up tomorrow and smell the coffee and get busy and do the work. They cannot. This is an internal neurogenetic executive failure. You can't self-motivate like other people. So it doesn't matter what your goals are, you won't get there. Because self-motivation is required for all goal-directed action. The final executive ability, which will not emerge until late childhood, in the person with ADHD, is the mind's playground. This is the ability to plan and problem solve. How many different possible options can you generate right now to get around this problem? This ability to simulate multiple possible future options is the highest executive function in humans. It is the source of all cultural innovation, but it originates in problem solving. How quickly in your mind can you think of multiple ways to overcome the problem you just encountered? And people with ADHD will struggle with this one as much as with the others. So if you want to understand ADHD as a parent, you have got to understand these are the five things that are delayed in this child. The ability to stop, to use visual imagery, to use your mind's voice, to use your mind's heart and emotion and motivation, 
and when called upon to do so, to simulate multiple possibilities when faced with a problem or when planning out what you hope to do, planning and problem solving. Those are the five executive abilities. We know where they are in the frontal lobe. We know that ADHD children have lost all five of them. Actually, that's a bit of an overstatement. It's not that they don't have them. It's that they are quite delayed, and we will discuss the delay in a moment. So ADHD leads you to act on impulse, not resist distraction. You are less able to think back about what you are doing, about the action that lies ahead. You cannot use your hindsight, and therefore your foresight is gone. You do not plan ahead. You live in the moment. This is going to rob you of your sense of time, because the sense of time comes from looking back to look ahead, looking across time and knowing where I'm going. You will not have a subjective sense of time, and that alone is going to be a devastating adult disability. You have the consummate disorder of time management. It's no wonder they're always late. You will not be able to talk to yourself, to reason with yourself, to ask yourself questions, and to remind yourself of the rules that are governing the immediate situation. And therefore, it doesn't matter what people say to you over and over and over again. You won't do it. No amount of nattering by your teacher or your mother will overcome the internal mind's voice deficit. You will not be able to use language as well as other people to regulate yourself. And that is going to also lead you to have a self-motivation problem and a problem with regulating your emotions and with self-soothing when you do become emotional. And then, as we've said, you will have trouble with planning and problem solving. So if you want to know the symptom list of ADHD, this is it. The DSM is but a mere superficial reflection of the most obvious symptoms of these five executive deficits. But to truly understand ADHD, you need to know that these five are all there underneath. To refer to ADHD as inattention is to refer to autism as hand flapping and speaking funny. They are the most obvious symptoms of a failure to develop the ability to relate to others as special objects, as humans. And that is what autism really is underneath. The rest of it is just the most superficial set of symptoms. So I would want my family to understand the profundity of these deficits, because inattention hardly captures what is going wrong in development. 